Welcome to Author's Voice, connecting authors to the world. You are watching A House Divided on Author's Voice today. I am your host for today. My name is Bjorn Skaftesen, and we have Timothy B. Smith with us, author of innumerable books about the Civil War in the West. And so, welcome to Author's Voice. Welcome back to Author's Voice, Tim. We're thank you, you, thank you. I always look forward to coming up here. Yeah, well, yeah, I know how much you love to go to Chicago, well, especially in the winter. You folks keep it a little cooler up here than I like, <laughs> but uh, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> today, Tim has two books. In fact, they're behind me, so I'm not gonna uh, wave them in front of your face. Uh, but we have two books that we are featuring, The Real Horse Soldiers, uh, published by Savas Beatty, and the decision was always my own. Uh, and these books are, you mentioned it before, Tim, the sort of the macro and the micro right. of the Vicksburg campaign. Tell me about how that, what do you mean by the macro and the micro between these two books? Well, the decision was always my own comes from a quote from Grant. Um, and uh, that's, it's dealing essentially with Grant during the Vicksburg campaign. Uh, as part of SIU, Southern Illinois University Press's uh, World of Ulysses S. Grant series. Yep. And uh, we can talk more about that um, maybe in a little bit. But um, it's, it's examining Grant over basically a nine-month period uh, as he is conducting operations against, against Vicksburg. Of course, Grierson's Raid, uh, the Real Horse Soldiers book, uh, is a part of the Vicksburg campaign, only one facet of it. Uh, so you get a, a book about the entire campaign, and then you get a book about the, the very specific operation of Grierson's Raid, which gets, you know, a little bit in the, in the larger context. But, um, but, you know, I've often said if you write a, a new book on every paragraph in another book, you never run out of things to do, I guess. So <laughs> exactly. Maybe I won't run out of things. So. Exactly. Well, and that's, uh, that's what it is. We have two books. One shows the, uh, the largest decisions mm -hmm. that Grant had to make in order to move this campaign forward that involved hundreds of thousands of uh, people, uh, tens of thousands of Union soldiers affected, all of the mm -hmm. civilians and all the rest his decisions in his headquarters. And in the other one, in The Real Horse Soldiers, you meet sergeants and you meet privates right. and you meet scouts that are off on. Uh, and so both of these books, of course, this leads me to recommend both of these books <laughs> to you. Uh, consider purchasing them. Uh, if you're watching this on right. authorsvoice.net, you can ask questions and please do. Uh, you can just type them in right there below. And if you're watching this on the Facebook live feed, just use the comment section to ask questions. I'd love to hear from you, and I have your questions right here on my tablet so I can, uh, we can get your questions sure. and we can answer them. But Tim, let's jump right into the real horse soldiers. Okay. I'm going to show everybody at home the real horse soldiers. Uh, now this is, how do I put this? This is a book that people will recognize the story. People at home will recognize the story, and it takes us back to a famous, one of the great John Ford Western, uh, Western movies uh, starring John Wayne. And that movie is, of course, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. Uh, now, if there's one line we know from The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, this is the West, sir. When the legend becomes fact, print the legend. Uh, of course, Tim thought I was going to talk about the horse soldiers, the, the 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 book, the movie that he actually quotes in the in the <clears throat> title of his book. But no, let's look at the the man who shot Liberty Valance. Tim, what happens when the legend becomes printed? Because I think that is I think that's part of the story of Grierson's raid. Right. We've never had a history. Not a uh, not a full academic treatment. No, no. Um, mm -hmm. There there are several books out there dealing with with the raid, um, and lots of legend, and lots of lots of legend, and most of that uh, comes not from print but from media, of course, mm -hmm. and novels, um, the Sinclair novel, and and so on. But most people are familiar with the Horse Soldiers, the movie, and I like the movie myself. I, I watch it every every so often. Um, in fact, when I finished the book, I went back and watched the movie and. Um, um, it's a movie, you know. It's it's a good movie. I like it, but uh, not a whole lot of uh, of truth in there. But um, 
but I thought it was time that we we look into the truth of it and and you know the truth is stranger than fiction sometimes and sometimes a better story and it's a it's a very good story it sure is and do you think that uh, uh, do you think that the legend has colored in any way what people expect to hear uh, when you've talked to people about, hey, I'm writing this book, or now that it's out, you've probably talked to some. Oh, I think so. I think people re may read the book and wait for Gerson to meet the blonde and, you know, ride off into the sunset with her, or uh, especially looking for the um, uh, the little boys, the cadets from the military school or, or something, you know. So uh, people think that's, that's real. Um, what was interesting, there are some... Uh, underlying, I guess, um, I don't know how to exactly explain it, but for instance, when Grierson is involved in a raid in Alabama later in the war, apparently he does come across a little boy's school and the cadets come out to at least see him. Or, or, so there are, there are a few little things that kind of tie together there, but certainly the cadets uh, weren't there on the raid mm -hmm. or, or any of that. I think John Ford just wanted to put the Battle of Newmarket uh, it, something like that in, somewhere in combine, uh, mm -hmm. combine the battles, yeah, mm -hmm. I guess so. But, but let's go back and start with, okay, the, the real world, real people. Who was Benjamin Grierson? Since we know he's not John Wayne, <laughs> who's, who's, who's not Benjamin? Not Colonel Marlowe either. He's not uh, Colonel Marlowe, right. He's actually a musician. Um, well, and even that is a little bit of a misnomer. He loved music. He, he, that was his, his first love, if you will. Uh, and he taught music. He played music, led bands, and and um, and so on. But the way he made a living, there there's not a lot of areas you can make a living in as a as a musician in those days, especially in Jacksonville, Illinois. These days too. Um, well, these days too. Yeah. <laughs> um, so he tries to make his living as a storekeeper, uh, as a as a um, store owner in uh, Meridosha, Illinois. And unfortunately, he and his partner lose everything in his. Um, uh, quest to, to run this store mainly because of the Panic of 1857 and uh, he's a very kind-hearted generous man and this appears in a lot of different areas in, in the raid and, and elsewhere in life and um, basically he gives too much on credit and loses the store and the house and everything and has to move back to Jacksonville with his uh, family and at the beginning of the war that's where they find him, uh, and he's out of luck. He's, he's very similar to Grant, actually, on a smaller scale. Uh, he's struck out in a lot of different areas, and, and he's down to basically just, just helping his dad, you know, in, his, in the family business. Uh, but war comes along and changes his fortunes, as it does for a lot of people, both good and bad. Some don't live through it, obviously, but uh, for the Grants and the Griersons, they come out of the war uh, light years ahead of what they, what they entered. Now, one, but one difference between Grant and Grierson uh, is that Grierson does not have a military education. Uh, right. He's, strict, he's a civilian soldier, a citizen exactly. soldier. Exactly, yeah. But what did you find in his background that led him to be effective once he became a colonel of cavalry? Well, there's not a lot there that would teach him these things. Uh, he spent some time as a youngster in the Ohio militia. Uh, as a bugler, of all things, obviously. And um, he joked later on about, you know, how military lacking that was and how it was just a fun time and they meet together and, and uh, he would talk about they, the, the soldiers would try to get their, their officers drunk and, you know, that would be an entertaining time and all that kind of stuff. Um, so he doesn't have a lot of training. And I'm a firm believer that, and I mention this all the time at Shallow and, and elsewhere, a lot of military tactics and know-how and so on is just basic common sense. You don't have to have a military academy education to know how to, to operate and to, to do things. Now, it certainly helps. It, it certainly won't hurt, unless Jefferson Davis, I guess, was so <laughs> saying that, that he knew just enough to be dangerous. But, um, you know, I think Grierson was gifted with just a whole lot of common sense and he would be able to utilize that particularly in the raid and in other raids it's not the only raid that he he conducts that's uh, the most famous of course but um john wayne doesn't star in movies about the, the other raids but uh he uh he utilizes that common sense 
And I think that just just uh, is kind of the essence of Grierson that you know no no military academy education nobody told him how to do this, and um, he'd never been in the cavalry before or any of that. But uh, he makes a name for himself during the Civil War and goes on to make a career out of it. You know he's colonel of the um, of the uh, Buffalo Soldiers, tenth tenth U.S. cavalry right. out west, and um, retires as a brigadier general. So. Mm -hmm. So he's a very he's good successful soldier successful. after not having any military exactly. yeah. education. <clears throat> now, uh, another thing that's the same, that's similar between Grant and Grierson, is that in the early part of the war, they're both searching for a role right. to play. Uh, and, Grant, and Grant becomes a civilian aide, I guess, to Governor Yates. Right. Uh, and then uh, Grierson becomes a civilian aide to, I guess it's Benjamin, Benjamin Prentice. Benjamin yeah. Prentice. Yeah. And so he does this for a while before he finds himself uh, uh, actually with a commission right. in a regiment. But there's one thing that I like seeing in your book, because I'm interested in Grant and Prentice and mm -hmm. all that. Uh, so Grierson is a witness to this contretemps <laughs> that occur between Grant and Prentice over in, rank. In, uh, over yeah. rank, and, and uh, that's not always. I think people know that happened because it's important in Grant's story where he goes up, and important in Prentice's story yeah. where he goes down yeah. in fortunes. But uh, it it was a it was it was a lot more heated once you learn a little bit about what. Grierson saw right. than just two officers comparing notes on who has the older exactly, commission. Exactly, yeah. And in fact, Grierson talks later on in his memoirs about um, <clears throat> Prentice. And remember, Grierson is a Prentice guy. He, 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 there's, there's no guarantee that Grant's going to be the one going up at this point. And Grierson is, is sticking with his guy, Prentice. Uh, but he, he makes the note that Prentice acts just pretty ugly toward Grant and uh, is not uh, not very nice at all in, in his words and, and so on. And uh, eventually, of course, uh, Grierson will get the commission as the major in the 6th Illinois. And uh, he's unpaid, actually, as an aide to, to Prentice. Uh, Prentice wants to pay him, but doesn't have a, a position for him. And uh, that's part of the same old story of Grierson, of course, that he can't make a living and, and uh, his wife is needing money and, and so on. At one point he says, uh, I think I'll just go home because if I'm going to starve to death, at least I'll starve to death in the arms of my wife or something like that. So mm -hmm. he, uh, he's on pretty rough times there for a little bit, but he uh, eventually hooks his star to, to Grant's wagon instead of Prentice's, and that's the correct decision. Right, and then uh, Governor Yates from Jacksonville. Right. And so he was in, I don't know how close they were as friends, but they were certainly neighbors, and they knew each yeah, other. Yeah, they knew each other, and in fact, um, it's, it's the governor that first gets Grierson involved in this. He calls him to Springfield to carry dispatches, uh, sends him down to Cairo to Prentice, and that's when Prentice, uh, one of the dispatches he's carrying is Prentice's commission as a Brigadier General. And uh, so Prentice says, well, stay on as one of my staff members and uh, unpaid, and I'll try to get you a, a paid staff member. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, he, will, he will do that. Uh, it will also be uh, Governor Yates that will appoint him as major in the the 6th Illinois Cavalry, and then of course is Colonel in the 6th Illinois Cavalry. And uh, Grierson tells about, he goes on to the, board the steamboat that Governor Yates is, is on, holding a party, and he goes and sees Governor Yates, and he says, I came off a Colonel. And uh, he says, the, the Governor introduced me to everybody as the youngest Colonel in the Union Army, a mere five minutes old. <laughs> <laughs> it, one, one fun thing about Benjamin Grierson is he's got this sense of humor. He he's has a, a He's a of, fun guy to read his memoirs, right. to get to know through his letters. And, and he must have been that, that kind of guy uh, in person because he's, he's very theatrical. He loves a good show. He loves music. He loves the classics. And uh, he, he's, he likes to laugh, he likes to have fun, and, and there's several instances of his humor in, um, in the book, including playing a trick on one of the plantation owners. I don't know if we want to talk about that later like on or not, it, yeah. uh, Mr. Sloan, but, mm -hmm. uh, but he liked to put on a show, and I kind of equate this, and I, you know, I don't, he doesn't come right out and say it, but I wonder if in the back of his mind, if he's not thinking in the midst of this whole thing, that I'm putting on the performance of a lifetime here. If I pull this off, this is going to be my greatest performance. And mm -hmm. it was. It was. Yeah. Well, let's get to, yeah, you mentioned the 6th 
Illinois Cavalry again, mm -hmm. and they become, uh, since this is the, the micro history that you drill down, you really get to meet in this book the individuals, and you realize uh, you have three Union Cavalry regiments mm -hmm. involved, and you're able to establish a certain character for each of the regiments. They each have their own, right. they're from a certain place. Right. The, you get letters and diaries that are significant between one and another. The first people you meet are the 6th Illinois mm -hmm. Cavalry Regiment. Tell us a little bit about them because they're, they're not like Grierson. No, they, uh, they come from southern Illinois, Little Egypt. Uh, uh, yeah. Most of the, the companies will come from the counties right along the Mississippi River and the Ohio River. Um, only one company, I believe, B, comes from uh, Morgan County up around Jacksonville, actually, uh, or, uh, Grierson's hometown. But um, they will be Democratic primarily. Grierson is a warm under the collar Republican, and mm -hmm. he, in fact, refers to them as his Democratic regiment or something to that effect at, at one point. But they get along. Uh, it's pretty rocky in the beginning. Um, Grierson is appointed to... Uh, one of the three, cavalry regiments have three majors because you divide them into battalions, four company battalions with a major in, in command of each. And uh, he's in charge of one of the four company battalions and uh, he will whip it into shape when the other two battalions are not. And even his appointment, when he is appointed major by the governor, there are several captains in the regiment that wanted that, that job. So it's, uh, it's one of those situations where you go in and take a new job and you're over people who wanted that job for themselves and think they could have done a much better job uh, than you. Um, sound familiar in terms mm -hmm. of Abraham Lincoln? Yes. You know? Yeah. <laughs> but um, so he had to he had to walk you know a, a fine line there and and be firm enough, but also be lenient enough. And he wins them over. One of those captains actually that he wins over. Uh, becomes his lieutenant colonel later on when he becomes colonel of the regiment uh, and um, and is the commander of the regiment on the raid, Reuben Loomis, who um, is an interesting character in and of himself. How uh, He negotiated the raid and ultimately what happened to him and all of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have a question. Okay. The, uh, this sort of last question leads us to our first question. I want to thank Doug Ashton, who's watching, mm -hmm. watching on Facebook okay. Live, uh, for the question and says he's enjoying the broadcast. He wants to know how many troopers participated in the raid and how many of them became casualties. Grierson starts the raid with probably 12, 1300. Uh, three regiments and a small artillery battery. Now he will send one of those regiments home um, three or four or five days into the raid. That's the second Iowa Cavalry under Colonel Edward Hatch. Uh, and in terms of John Wayne's movie, that's pretty factual. Uh, John Wayne sends, who is it, um, Wayne E. 2nd Iowa, I believe, actually back um, to try to create a diversion, and Grierson actually does that. Uh, but the Iowans will be sent back. That'll leave Grierson with about 900, 1,000 men on the, the vast majority of the raid. Now, in terms of casualties, uh, he only loses, um, I think, if I remember off the top of my head, maybe three outright killed uh, and six or eight, ten wounded, um, two or three, four or five missing, you know, that just, just can't make it. Uh, but, uh, but very small casualties to have ridden the length of the state of Mississippi, uh, dodging Confederates here and there and attacking Newton and everywhere else and all these railroads and so on. It's an amazing feat when you think about it. They moved lost, so fast the Confederates couldn't catch exactly, them. Exactly, to have lost so, so few uh, in, in such a race.